Welcome to the 3 a.m. lowdown. This is conditions in Russia helped create the revolution. So did they help determine what that revolution became. That was a totalitarianism greater than even the Russians had ever known. When the Bolsheviks took power in Russia, they moved the capital from Petrograd to Moscow, and they unfurled a new Russian flag. Its field was red, the traditional European symbol of revolution. On the red field were a cross, hammer, and sickle to show the union of workers and peasants. The dream of communism, the original purpose of the Russian Revolution, was a better life for these workers and peasants. The Bolsheviks renamed their country the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The revolution was supposed to bring a dictatorship of the proletariat with all power in the hands of the Soviets. But after half a lifetime of conspiracy, Lenin knew how to operate only through his own organization. And so what developed was a dictatorship over the proletariat, with all power in the hands of what came to be called the Communist Party. The first clear sign of this was what happened to the democratically elected assembly, which met just a few months after the revolution. When Lenin saw that his Bolsheviks had only a minority of the assembly, he sent in troops to break it up. Russia hasn't had a free election since. In March of 1918, Bolshevik and German negotiators met to end their part of World War I. The Germans held all the cards. Millions of Russians were humiliated by the terms the Bolsheviks accepted. This was one cause of the civil war that swept Russia in 1918. The force that fought the Bolsheviks came to be known as the White Army. Defending the revolution was the Red Army. It was led by Leon Trotsky, now Commissar of War. To protect their interests, the US, Britain, France, and Japan sent in forces. The surrounded and threatened, Lenin tightened his total rule. He outlawed all political parties but his own. He sent armed gangs to seize food from the peasants. He decreed that strikes were treason. Finally, Trotsky and the Red Army won the Civil War the foreign troops withdrew, but Russia was in chaos. Factories and most railroads had broken down. Famine took over. During the winter of 1921 and 22, perhaps five million people died of hunger. There would have been more had we not sent help. Herbert Hoover's American Relief Administration by the summer of 1922 was feeding 10 million Russians a day. To cope with chaos, Lenin prescribed an unmarxist dose of capitalism. He called it a new economic policy. Slowly, the economy improved. But Lenin used the Red Army even on fellow Bolsheviks who complained about what the revolution had become. Thus, defending his power, Lenin marched the road to tyranny. Trotsky had predicted some of this. He warned in 1903, the organization of the party takes the place of the party itself. The Central Committee takes the place of the organization. And finally, the dictator takes the place of the Central Committee. This is precisely what happened. Lenin set the stage, the dictator was in the wings, and Trotsky was his most famous victim. The dictator was known as Stalin. His real name was Joseph Vissarionovich Jugashvili. He'd been born in 1879 in the south of Russia. Stalin's mother wanted him to become a priest. He went to seminary in Tiflis for five years, but was then kicked out for failing to take his exam. He spent too much of his time preaching to the workers in Tiflis, not the gospel of Christ, but the promises of Mark. Stalin became a revolutionary organizer and Lenin's man. 
He spent about half of his 20s and 30s in jail in Siberia or on the way to or from both. He was made a cabinet officer, a commissar in Lenin's government. By 1922, he had two commissar's jobs and was also secretary general of the party. That same year, Lenin had a stroke. Who would succeed him if he died? Lenin and Trotsky thought it should not be Stalin. Lenin wrote in a kind of political will, Stalin is too rude, and this fault becomes unbearable in the office of general secretary. Therefore, I propose to the comrades to find a way to remove Stalin from that position and appoint to it another man. But before Lenin could drop Stalin, he died. And because Trotsky was ill, was Lenin's chief pallbearer. Stalin wrapped himself in Lenin's memory. And then the man Lenin had wanted out sided with enough of his comrades to defeat Trotsky in the fight for Lenin's job. Then, Stalin sided with others to defeat those who'd helped him first. By 1928, Stalin had eliminated all rivals. He'd kicked Trotsky out of the government, out of the party, and out of the country. Stalin's victory over Trotsky, triumph of peasant Oriental Russia over intellectual Western Russia. Trotsky had argued that revolution in Russia could last only if it were accompanied by the overthrow of capitalism in Western Europe. But Stalin didn't look west. He looked to Russia by itself. And he set out to build what he called socialism in one country. Like a modern Moses, Stalin ordered his people towards the promised land, but he insisted that they run, not walk. The result was a second revolution. It started on Russia's 25 million private farms. Stalin decided to collectivize them, to wipe them out, and substitute for them huge farms to be run like factories. Naturally, the peasants resisted, so Stalin sent his troops into the countryside to force collectivization. The result was another civil war. Stalin later told Sir Winston Churchill that over five million peasants were killed. Simultaneously, Stalin tried to make Russia a modern industrial power. He wiped out all private ownership, and in 1928 drew up a five-year plan with production goals for every factory. There was no job choice. People worked where the party told them to work. In terms of quantity, the results were impressive. Oil and pig iron production doubled. By 1932, Russia was making 50 times many tractors as she did in 1928. The name Stalin, which means man of steel, took on a new meaning. It can be argued that Stalin's industrialization probably enabled Russia to survive World War II, but the price was the sacrifice of a generation. There was no freedom, only work, hardship, propaganda, and the secret police. One night, Stalin's wife, Nadja, spoke out against all this. Stalin shouted her down. She left the room and committed suicide. But Stalin continued to force the pace of industrialization and collectivization. That continued the discontent. So, like an ancient czar, Stalin began a purge. There were show trials and forced confessions. Stalin seemed to suspect everyone. It's been estimated that about two million Russians were killed and seven million more arrested. By 1938, almost all of the old Bolsheviks were gone. Nikita Khrushchev says Stalin told his police, beat, beat, and once again, beat. The climax of Stalin's terror came on August 20th, 1940. Leon Trotsky had wandered over much of the world protesting what Stalin was doing. In 1940, he was living in Mexico. A man most people believe to have been one of Stalin's agents smashed Trotsky's head in with an axe. Trotsky's blood battered on the paper in front of him, on which he'd been writing his account of Stalin's career. Thus, with total control, did Stalin emerge as a czar of Russia, no less powerful or brutal than Ivan the Terrible. 
thus did Russia capture the revolution. On the red flag of the Soviet Union, above the crossed hammer and sickle, there is a star. To the Russians, its five points symbolize the five continents of the world, which they believe will someday become communist. But to us, that star suggests a new Russian imperialism. Karl Marx once wrote, the policy of Russia is changeless. Its method, its tactics, its maneuvers may change, but the polar star of its policy, world domination, is a fixed star. This is still true. The Russians, as Russians, want a world ruled by Russia, and as Marxists, they want a world of communism. We face both forces. The Russia Stalin built began expanding in 1939. Always Russia had tried to protect her western borders. When Nazi Germany began moving towards them and Britain and France didn't fight, Stalin felt he had to make a deal. So Russia and Germany signed a pact. They promised not to attack each other. They agreed to divide Eastern Europe between them. Russia got part of Poland and then attacked Finland. The Finns fought well, but eventually Russia took part of their country. And then Russia went on to grab part of Romania and all of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. But the deal with Germany did not last. In 1941, Germany attacked. German troops pushed the Russians back nearly to Moscow. At least 7 million, perhaps 10 million Russians were killed in action. Another 10 million civilians died. Millions more were crippled. 25 million people were homeless. We probably deceive ourselves today if we forget Russia's fear of a strong Germany. Eventually, with our help, Russia pushed the Germans back. The turning point was the Battle of Stalingrad. Germans began surrendering by the thousands. the bayonets of the Red Army, Russia took over Eastern Europe. Communists came to power in Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Albania. Each country was called a people's democracy. But what this meant was total control by the Communist Party and the secret police, each taking orders from Moscow. The rest of Europe might now be behind what Sir Winston Churchill called an Iron Curtain, had we not learned that Russia today, like Russia always, pulls back when its enemy stands firm. When the Communists threatened Greece and Turkey just after the war, we sent help and the Communists withdrew. When the Russians blockaded Berlin in 1948, we answered with an airlift and went on to forge the North Atlantic Treaty Organization for the defense of all Western Europe. In 1950, communists in North Korea led an attack on South Korea. We and our allies fought back. We soon faced not only the North Koreans, but the Chinese, too. The year before, communists had taken over China after more than 20 years of terrorism and war. Fifty-four thousand two hundred and forty-six Americans were killed in Korea, but the communists were contained. Thus, with Russia, and now China, too. Historic national interests have been one side of the imperialism we've faced. The other side, however, is 
just as important. That's the old idea of a communist world. Just a few weeks after the Russian Revolution, Lenin organized what he called the Communist International, for short, the Common Term. This was an association of communist parties under tight Russian leadership devoted to overthrowing the government in their country. The Communist Party of the USA was born in 1919. It joined the Common Term. In 1936, when Spain fought a civil war, Russia sent help to communists there, so did the parties in other countries. And today, throughout the world, Russian and now Chinese leadership, money, and propaganda are aiding communists trying to undermine and upset their government. The ideas of Marx and Lenin gave their believers everywhere great self-confidence. They think that what Russia and China have done is what all the rest of the world will do. Moreover, to many people, communism seems a great moral force. So party members in non-communist countries put the interests of communist countries ahead of their own. We learned this after World War II, when American communists were convicted of having stolen our military secrets for Russia on orders from Russia. The man who leads the imperialism of the five-pointed star is Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev chairman of the Council of Ministers, first secretary of Russia's Communist Party. Khrushchev was Stalin's man. He survived the purges of the 30s and climbed the party apparatus because he did whatever Stalin said. Khrushchev was never a Bolshevik conspirator who had to change his name. He was a boisterous jack-of-all-trades who had left school when he was 15 and drifted into the Communist Party during the Civil War of 1918. The party taught Khrushchev to think its way. The peasant boy became the organization man, boss of the Ukraine during the war. When Stalin died in 1953, Khrushchev took over the party and soon after that, the country. He became the man most responsible for spreading Russian power and Marxist revolution. Khrushchev uses many weapons. First is the threat of naked force. He has tested a 57 megaton bomb. He tried to sneak missiles into Cuba. But Khrushchev knows that all-out war with modern weapons would be suicide. Russia would lose all she has built. So Khrushchev continues the version and propaganda and support of little wars. And he's toured many of the underdeveloped countries, trying to lure their leaders to his side with economic aid. Most of all, Khrushchev is counting on Russian production to do us in. Russia now produces less than half of the total amount of things we do. Khrushchev claims that Russia will pass us in production per person by 1970. This is what he meant when he said, we will bury you. With the power and prosperity he sees ahead for Russia, Khrushchev believes that the world communist revolution will come by imitation as well as by intrigue. But Russia is no longer communism's only leader. The communist bloc has been split by the rise of China. China's communism is at least as totalitarian as Russia's ever was, but on every major element, on ideology, on revolution, on imperialism. Mao Zedong and the other leaders of China see things their way, not Russia. As Marxists, both Mao and Khrushchev are dedicated to world domination. They argue not about the end, only about the means. As national leaders, however, their interests could conflict. What's good for China might not seem good for Russia. How this split will affect communist imperialism, we don't know. But there is reason to think that that imperialism will be contained. Nikita Khrushchev and the other leaders of the communist nations face our power. And as advocates of world revolution, they face a growing awareness in all countries that the realities of communism do not match its dreams. A look at some of those realities in just a moment.
Today, one-third of all the people in the world live under communism. Today, there are communist parties in about 90 countries. Communism has come a long way since 1917, and this achievement has been one of its great lures. Moreover, throughout the underdeveloped world, men face the same problems today that Stalin faced in 1928. How can they make their countries modern fast? They look at Russia's huge dams and glowing Sputniks and wonder whether communist totalitarianism is the only technique. But some of these people seem to be taking a second look. They're seeing that each of communism's achievements is a monument to sacrifice and that the price of success with the colossal has been failure in the ordinary. Neither Russia nor any other communist country has yet figured out a way to grow enough food. And even if they could, there's mounting evidence that even communists do not live by bread alone. The young people of Russia especially seem bored with their lives. Even though the party disapproves, they've embraced jazz, blue jeans, and J.D. Fallon. When Stalin died, a wave of relief swept Russia. Even the leaders of the party agreed that there must be an end to government by murder. So Khrushchev was forced to denounce Stalin and ease the terror. He erased the name of Stalin throughout the communist world. He even changed the name of Stalingrad. It's now Volgograd. And in 1961, Khrushchev moved Stalin's body from Lenin's tomb to a less honored place nearby. But the Russian secret police are still there. The power of the party remains absolute. It's still a dictatorship over, not of, the proletariat. And in Eastern Europe, the world has seen with horror, but with great clarity, what communism can mean. In East Berlin, by 1953, people were so fed up with Russian rule, they fought tanks with nothing but screams and rocks. In 1956, the people of Hungary revolted. They thought they'd won, thought the Russians would go home. But coldly and brutally, Khrushchev sent back his tanks. And then in 1961, when the cream of East Germany was pouring into West Berlin, Khrushchev had to build a wall. What a comment on communism the wall is. If it weren't for totalitarian control and Russian imperialism, there'd be a revolution against, not for, those who built it. And what an irony that one of the results of Marxist ideology should be that thing in Marxist native land. Ideology, revolution, totalitarianism, imperialism. These are some of the faces of communism. And each face is molded by the special interests of the nation in which you find it. These are the people who go there. And how far they go depends on who goes here. Can our power and our will check their imperialism? Can our self-discipline match their totalitarianism? Can we help wipe out the conditions that invite revolution? Above all, can our freedom and our faith deny their ideology. We think they can. Thank you for watching and for listening. This is Bob Abernethy, NBC News, New York. Good evening. Like, share, and subscribe, please. It helps out a lot. Thank you.